we'll talk about um, second line bladder cancer therapies when first line treatments fail. And for the purposes of this, um, you know, our bladder cancer session is going a little bit from non-muscle invasive to muscle invasive. So we're gonna hang out with non-muscle invasive disease for the most part. I have no disclosures for this topic. Um, so in the non-muscle invasive bladder cancer world, uh, that consists of clinical TA, clinical T1, and then clinical TIS, urothelial cancer. And um, we have to take a step back and look at what are the first line therapies and how do we define failure first. So we'll spend a moment talking about that. Guidelines are relevant, new, new data, new guidelines are important in this um, subject area. So uh, this is a very good um, guideline to have as a reference. Um, if you don't know the AUA guidelines are on an app, you can download that and use that kind of in real time in your clinic. But um, you can also take this information and just have it as a reference. They have a nice table in the guidelines, but this is my kind of recreation of the table. And we know that the AUA has tried to reclassify non-muscle invasive bladder cancer into some more kind of practical categories um, instead of the index patients that were in the old guidelines. So in terms of low risk, there are very few patients that fall into this group, but those are usually solitary, low-grade TAs, less than three centimeters, or the entity of um, low malignant potential, pun lump. Um, intermediate risk is recurrences of low-grade disease, um, low-grade disease that's greater than three centimeters, multifocal low-grade disease, and then small high-grade TAs. They also do put low-grade T1 in this group, which is something I thought you should never see, but I have seen more than once um, in, the, in the last few years. And high-risk is all the other people that have high-risk high-grade disease, um, and we'll look at these a little bit more. So in terms of what are guidelines for use of additional adjuvant therapy, in low-risk disease, a, a single small low-grade TA or pun lump, you should consider perioperative intravesical chemotherapy. And I do think, as Dr. Lerner said, that is the sort of perfect patient for a single dose of chemotherapy because you're not going to want to give them or going to need to subject them to six weeks of additional intravesical therapy later. Intermediate risk, um, again, the categories here, these are patients where you should consider perioperative intravesical chemotherapy and should consider uh, induction intravesical therapy, and they don't really make a strong statement for or against mitomycin or BCG. And if you do give BCG, then one-year maintenance is all that's necessary. There's some data that shows that you can get away with only one year in intermediate risk disease. It's some European EORTC data. High risk then, they say should consider perioperative intravesical chemotherapy. There is some retrospective data that says even patients with high grade disease may um, confer a benefit or derive a benefit from that single dose, but they really need the adjuvant therapy. So this is where you should give induction intravesical chemo or intravesical BCG predominantly for this high grade disease. And when using BCG, the patient should try to get up to three years maintenance therapy. So how, how is intravesical therapy used in the real world? There's a recent publication that looked at um, about 10 years of SEER Medicare patient treatments. Um, this was in the 1990s to early 2000s, but really in the real world, there are still very low rates of BCG use. Um, this was all patients with what um, was high grade non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. And after the first TUR, in all patients who should be getting BCG, there were only 40% uh, shown to have BCG. And after the first TUR, so this is 60% did not get BCG. Um, uh, over 20% got partial induction course. Um, about 7% got one full induction course, and only 7% got induction plus additional maintenance. Um, if the patient, if they, they looked at a cumulative use of BCG uh, after multiple resections, and so they saw that when a patient was having to go back multiple times, so they had more resections, if the patient had at least three resections, then the overall use of BCG was up to 63%. So we're getting closer to ideal, and this was the breakdown. So definitely more patients also getting induction plus maintenance by having more doses over their sort of records in SEER, um, in their Medicare administrative records. There's um, very good data that shows that maintenance does improve response. So if you gave um, BCG induction alone versus at least one course of BCG maintenance, uh, there's a 60% 
um, recurrence rate with BCG induction alone versus a 41% recurrence rate um, once you give an additional round of maintenance. So uh, you first have to ask, was your first line management adequate? Um, using good surgical principles for making sure that you capture muscle in the specimen, uh, always uh, trying to resect the disease completely, potentially using enhanced imaging technologies if they're available to you with blue light or narrowband imaging, and then judicious use of perioperative chemotherapy, as I mentioned, sort of selecting the right patient for that intravesical chemotherapy installation. Certainly, uh, all high-grade disease and most intermediate-grade disease should undergo repeat resection within six weeks of the first resection. We know that there's up to a 50% rate of persistent malignancy at that time of re-resection, and even this 15 to 30% rate of upstaging, so going from TA to finding T1, or more importantly, even having T1 disease at the first resection and finding T2 upon re-resection. And of course, that rate is much higher if there wasn't the rate differential if you have muscle in the first resection is lower than if there's no muscle in the first resection, you're more likely to find muscle invasive disease the second time. Um, and certainly it's been shown that the more debulked the cancer is, the better response the patient will have or the cancer will have to BCG therapy. So then treatment failure. In these entities that are non-muscle invasive, we have all these different definitions of refractory, resistant, relapsing. They get very confusing and hard to keep straight. So um, they've gone away, at least in terms of definitions. And um, this uh, consensus has come around for our BCG unresponsive, non-muscle invasive disease. It started in 2015 with two different consensus groups describing these patients. Um, it, First, must be qualified that they've received adequate BCG. They have to have at least received five of six doses induction. And then uh, unresponsive can be determined right away if they have high grade T1 at their first evaluation after their induction course, or you have to have given the patient at least one induction and either repeat induction or maintenance, at least two of three doses, and you find persistent or recurrent high grade disease within six months. Um, so this tries to harmonize a lot of these failures into one or two sort of easier to, to categorize definitions. Um, and that's, ha that's enabled us to have better clinical trials as well for clinical trials using these same definitions as they enroll and evaluate patients. Um, it actually brings us closer to um, FDA approvals for drugs um, in this group. So this is just a schema where you kind of go through the first couple of steps. These patients with high-grade disease receive induction BCG. If they have negative cystoscopy, negative cytology, they can continue on maintenance BCG. If they have a positive cysto and or a positive cytology, uh, in the high-grade TA or TIS, you will continue on BCG. Uh, as Dr. Lerner said, you could actually stay right on maintenance BCG. Uh, some people would re-challenge with another induction course. But if they have at that very first evaluation uh, persistent or new high-grade T1, that's already um, an unresponsive BCG, BCG unresponsive disease. You can then go on from repeat induction or maintenance, and if you find additional high-grade disease, that's when you again call BCG unresponsive. Um, couple of unique categories are when you have CIS-only disease, as we've alluded, it may take up to six months to see that carcinoma in situ resolve. So you, you would not call a three-month positive cytology or a three-month CIS a failure. And what if the patient has had a disease-free interval? They might have even stopped BCG. If you've had uh, at least 12 months disease-free, you could even consider re-challenging with BCG. They may have responded, they may have had good response initially, and they now have a new, and a new occurrence of non-muscle invasive disease. And when you take this patient to confirm the presence of persistent or recurrent disease, there are a lot of key elements in the staging that are important. Uh, you need to look into the upper tracts or at least do retrogrades or even selective, selective washings if you uh, do not see any visible disease in the bladder. You definitely have to rule out occult disease in the prostatic urethra. Uh, you may also consider random biopsies or targeted biopsies based on your um, enhanced imaging to rule out carcinoma in situ in small areas in the bladder. Examiner anesthesia may also be important, um, and, and certainly making sure you're 
um, CT urogram is current within six months. And some of these high-risk features, particularly lymphovascular invasion, prostatic urethral involvement, or multifocal or extensive disease, these really portend a much greater risk of progression. So even if the patient has a TA or T1 right now, these patients are more likely to come back with T2, T3, T4 disease, and you're probably going to want to emphasize the importance of early cystectomy. So we've established these patients are BCG unresponsive. Where do we go next? Radical cystectomy is our gold standard for these patients. But as we've already had in our discussion, there are a lot of patients who are either not willing or not fit to have that radical cystectomy. So then we have salvage intravesical therapy options. Um, only one is FDA approved, but we'll talk about those that are available. And then um, a, a fantastic um, array of clinical trials. So intravesical therapy that has been described in um, research studies and in good, usually phase two and some phase three data include BCG plus interferon, valrubicin, or gemcitabine, or gemcitabine docetaxel as a doublet. Um, BCG plus interferon um, is something that had a good phase two um, report. And they showed that patients who had been BCG naive were 59% disease free at 24 months. If they had had prior BCG and now you added interferon, the next induction, they were 45% disease free at 24 months. But it really did not prove to be better than BCG alone. The combination was thought to maybe reduce the toxicity or the side effects, but that was um, hard to kind of recapitulate in the data. Uh, and certainly they showed that uh, there were poorer outcomes the more BCG the patient had already had. That patient is relatively BCG resistant and interferon isn't going to change that. Um, they did do a, there was another large phase three study and there was ultimately no difference in effect plus or minus interferon. Um, sometimes in a BCG naive setting, it may be worthwhile to include interferon, but it will not necessarily salvage a patient who is already not responding well to BCG. Valrubicin is the only FDA approved option of all of these intravesical therapies, but it is only FDA approved for a patient that has CIS only in the bladder. It's given weekly for six weeks. Um, it did have a period where it was off the market, so it sort of fell out of favor or knowledge or familiarity. But in terms of results, 18% um, of patients had a complete response at three months. Uh, but at 12 months, only 10% estimated to be disease-free, and at 24 months, only 2%. Uh, in the trials um, that were published, there was a, approximately 30% of patients went on to cystectomy by two years. So it may have a role, but it doesn't seem to have a very durable effect, and I don't know that it's used widely at all. Uh, Single-agent gemcitabine has also been described in um, single-agent single, single agent, uh, non-randomized trials, and this is 2 grams in 100, millimeter, 100 milliliters of normal saline. Uh, the sort of planned uh, schedule is six weekly doses and then monthly for 12 months. In these patients, there was a nice effect that was durable. 28% of patients were disease-free at 12 months, 21% of patients disease-free at 24 months. And keep in mind, these are patients who you've already decided didn't respond to BCG. And I'm sorry, their disease didn't respond. I'm trying to change my terminology. So out of 47 patients total, we uh, are happy to see that the majority of them had high-grade disease, so we can trust this as effective. But only two of the patients in the trial had high-grade T1. So a word of caution, certainly, if you're trying to give a, if you're trying to salvage a high-grade T1 with gemcitabine. Uh, if you add docetaxel to gemcitabine, it's a little bit of work for the patient. They have to stay in your clinic for maybe three hours to get this treatment. But gemcitabine in 50 ml of sterile water, uh, 90 minutes in still time, and docetaxel in normal saline, for 120 minutes, <coughs> there was no set maintenance course recommended, but they had 66% complete response at that first three-month evaluation, um, and 34% disease-free without recurrence out to two years. 
Um, Johns Hopkins had a, their own um, prospective uh, trial or prospective cohort, and they had 42% of these patients without high-grade recurrence at two years. And interestingly, or another way to look at that is that they avoided cystectomy in 64% of their patients who had high-risk disease. So it really does have a potential value in particularly those patients that you are, are very worried about performing such a huge operation on. It certainly is better for BCG naive than BCG failing disease. Uh, generally speaking, when someone's cancer has been resistant to BCG, it's more likely to be resistant to anything else you might try. So just always keep that in mind. Um, clinical trials are really uh, the future here. Uh, there are many trials right now looking at checkpoint inhibitors. Pembrolizumab is in a multi-center international multi-site uh, phase two study um, using or by Merck. Uh, there also is a SWOG1605 studying atezolizumab for BCG unresponsive disease. Dervelimab, this is a single center it looks like. Um, and also even combining a checkpoint inhibitor with additional BCG. Uh, there are several different trials looking at interesting vaccine therapies to try to bolster the immune system so the patient continues BCG but you give them something else that's thought to enhance their own innate immunity like one of these um, particular proteins. There's also intravesical vaccinium. That trial has um, closed accrual and has not yet reported outcomes. There's also adenovirus um, oncolytic kind of uh, um, absorbed um, agents and even a different um, um, preparation of interferon that can be given um, in addition to BCG. Um, it's just something that's pretty exciting. If you go on clinicaltrials.gov and ask for trials on bladder cancer, there are almost 250 interventional trials going on right now. This is in all different disease states. I'm not talking only about non-muscle invasive disease, but I think it makes all of us who treat bladder cancer really excited to see that much energy and ongoing um, investigation. Some, um, some details um, for other ideas that you can try to improve your results with BCG. There are two trials for BCG naive patients. One is also through the cooperative groups. SWOG 1602 is looking at intradermal BCG before giving intravesical BCG. It's thought to jumpstart the immune response to make the cancer more responsive to the intravesical installations. Um, it also is bringing the Tokyo strain, which is not currently approved in the US, trying to bring that into a clinical trial to try to get that approved because, as you all may know, we had a huge BCG shortage and the Connaught strain is no longer being produced. So if we were to have another shortage of BCG, uh, it would be nice to have more options in terms of where to source that from. And they may have different effic efficacies because of how they've been derived over the years. Um, and there are a lot of valuable translational correlates going on with this, uh, with this trial. There's also this interesting um, interleukin super agonist that is also driving the immune system, stimulating natural killer cells, stimulating T cells, and giving this in the bladder in conjunction with BCG, trying to really augment the BCG response. So there are some things being studied right now. Um, and, you know, of course, BCG is our mainstay. We do not want to abandon the very first immunotherapy uh, that's been available uh, for, for cancer in general and certainly in bladder cancer. Um, for good references, uh, the NCCN guidelines, here's the link to, to go to that. Certainly the AUA non-muscle invasive bladder cancer guidelines as well. These are the two um, BCG unresponsive statements that try to um, harmonize and summarize those patients. And then uh, looking for clinical trials or looking for ideas, uh, clinicaltrials.gov has become a little more user-friendly to search and, and understand. And then um, even the Bladder Cancer Advocacy Network has a clinical trial dashboard available online uh, for other resources.